Shall we pray? Jehovah Lord, indeed, as we've sung, indeed, you are the Lord. You are the God and the King of our hearts, Jehovah Lord, and each and everything of us, Father Lord, we attribute it to you, Jehovah. My Father and my Lord, we gathered here this evening, Jehovah Lord, to just listen of you. We've gathered here, King of Kings, with different needs in our lives. We've gathered here, Jehovah Lord, with different expectations, Jehovah Lord, in our lives. My Father, Lord, how I pray, King of Kings, that even as we hear from your word, as I bring forth your word, that you may use of me, guide each and every meditation in my mind, guide each and every word that will come, Father, Lord, from my mouth to honor you and to lift up your holy name and to meet, Jehovah, Lord, your will over our lives. For we pray this trusting and believing in the mighty name of Jesus. And all the people of God say amen. amen. And all the people of God say amen. Seats you can have our seats even as you appreciate the praise and worship team. Let's appreciate the praise team. Buana Sifiwe. As my name has been said, I'm Barak Obara. I'm born again and I love the Lord as my personal savior. And I thank the Lord even for the strength to stand here this evening to just bring forth his word. And also in a special way, appreciate the provost who is the leader of this cathedral for allowing me to stand here and bring the word of the Lord to us. Buana Sifiwe. Allow me to read the word of the Lord from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 1, beginning to read at verse 1. 1 Samuel, chapter number 1 beginning to read at verse 1. The word of the Lord says that here there was a certain man from Ramadhan, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zaph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Penina, and the, uh, one was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of, uh, of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because, she, because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Anna stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the, Lord, of the Lord's house. In a deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. And this is the word of the Lord. Church, we are so blessed today as we gather here this evening to listen to the word of the Lord and our title for the sermon today is Waiting on the Lord. Just tell your neighbor, Waiting on the Lord. Ambiyo Jirani Mungine, Waiting on the Lord. So, waiting on the Lord is what we shall be focusing on today. Last week we are here and we looked on the virtue of hope. So, today we are just building on that even as we focus on the aspect of waiting. 
So actually, if you read scripture, some scripture, hope, and wait have been used interchangeably. But waiting is sort of the active part of hoping. That waiting is that active part of it. And waiting of the Lord is something that most of us have ever done or even now are in those seasons. And truth be told, waiting on the Lord for Christians is the most difficult aspect of a Christian life. Waiting is that bit of staying in a space, that you're in a space where you're staying before you access what you've been looking for. For example, you come here, you want to meet maybe the provost of this cathedral, you go to a minister's office, or even the president's office, then you're put in a space where you wait, a waiting room. So you are in that space with anticipation that actually I'm here to see this person. So even in life, some of us are in those spaces. We're in a season where you're anticipating to get something. If I am waiting for a particular thing to happen, what I mean is that I know that this thing will happen eventually. I just need to allow time. I'm waiting to see this doctor. I know that eventually I'll see this doctor. I just need to allow the queue to pass on. But it is not an easy thing. Yes, I'm at the bank. I'm waiting to be served, deposit this cash to make such an important payment that maybe will change my life, that maybe will beat a certain deadline. But there's a queue, if I look, roughly maybe 30 or 40 people in that queue. But I'm anticipating that my time will come when I'll be at the counter to be served. Most of us, our lives are in that form that we're in seasons where you're in a queue, sort of, quote unquote, that you're waiting for something to happen. You're waiting for an opportunity to come. You've done all that needs to be done. You're in that bank. You have your money with you. You've filled that banking slip. You've come to the right bank. You know the right name that you're addressing that check to. But you're waiting for that opportune time to come and be at the, uh, at the, the table where you'll be served. Praise the Lord. The process of waiting most often does not seem inviting and enjoyable. Because you're in that queue, you're asking yourself, there are certain things I could have done. If only I could have done this now, there are certain things I could have done out of this. So it's not an enjoyable season or it's not an enjoyable state to be in. Psalm 27, 14, the psalmist says that wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. So the psalmist here encourages us that there is a season that cometh in a man's life that you have to wait, and in this context, wait for the Lord. That you know, yes, I am God's servant. Yes, I attend every Wednesday service. Yes, I did the fasting. I'm fasting in the season of Lent, but you're in that space that you're waiting the Lord to act on your life. So he's, he's reminding us that we need to know that there are those seasons that will come that we'll have to wait. And he goes on and says that actually this season call for strength and call for courage. Because he said that be strong and let your heart take courage. So this insinuates that actually if you are not strong and you are not courageous, you might fall off the queue. You might not meet the person, the cashier waiting for you at the counter. You might fall off and leave and say that I'll come some other time. We live in a world where we find ourselves mostly comparing ourselves to others. That you look at your life and look at some people that you know. Maybe you are of the same age, but they're at a certain level. Comparing yourself, you feel like there's a level you've lagged behind. Maybe you look at people that you are with in school, maybe you even excelled more than them, but you look at the things they've achieved, you ask yourself, where did I go wrong? 
Or sometimes you look at the people you grew up in, you look at the people you started your career with, you look at the people you started a certain season with, but it seems things are working for them and things are not working for you. You look at this and ask yourself a lot of questions. And the funny bit is that more often than not, some of these people who even excel than us are not even believers. Some of these people that you look at deep within you, you feel you are better than them. Don't even pray as you do. Don't fast as you do. Don't commit to the Lord as you do. And I love what Job asked in Job 21. He asked that, why do the wicked live long? Growing old and increasing in power, they see their children established around them. Their offspring before their eyes. Their homes are safer, free from fear. So you are here, you're in a space where you trust in the Lord. I'm waiting on the Lord to open this door. I'm knocking on this door. You come, you're told to ask, seek, knock. You're asking, you're seeking, you're knocking. But looking around you, you see other people flourishing. You're asking yourself, what did these people do? There even some you know took those shortcuts. But you are there trusting in the Lord and you're in that space, that waiting room. You're still in that queue. I pictured a picture where you're in that queue to go to the bank. Then there are some people just coming straight to the counter or New York Watchman and Amleta and Vukisha Street and you're there just waiting. And this happens even in our lives. That you're waiting in something that you know of someone who took a shortcut in and even that person didn't deserve it. The psalmist says in Psalm 73, if you read verse 1 to 13, he talks of such a season. And I love what he says in verse 3. He said that, For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. That this psalmist was so trusting in the Lord, was so waiting in the Lord, was in that room, waiting for the Lord to do that miracle for him. But he looks around and even envied, envied the arrogant. That these people are so arrogant and he sees prosperity, the wicked prospering. And in verse 5, he says that they are free from common human burdens. He asks the Lord, why? These people are even free from common human burdens, but they are not plagued by human ills. They are not plagued by human ills. In verse 12 to 13, he says that this is what the wicked are like always free of care, they go on as, uh, amassing wealth. And he says that surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and I've washed my hands in innocence. That is the story of most of us. That in your walk with the Lord, you've kept your heart pure. That in your service of the Lord and in your pursuit to seek the Lord, you've kept your hand innocence. That you've trusted in the Lord for so long, but you're still in that space, the waiting space. Waiting in God is actually a season where you know that you are ripe for something. You know that I'm actually ripe for this thing, but still you don't have it. So you wait on the Lord to make it happen. Waiting on the Lord is that season where you have that experience, you are ripe. Yes, I have this experience to take dominance of this space. I have this knowledge to take dominance of this space, but still you're waiting on him to make it happen. You are ripe. You even have those papers. You have those academic qualifications. You are ripe. You have that qualification. You are ripe because you are of age, but you're still in that space, waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord is that season where you have indications to even show that you deserve what is before you. You have indication to show that actually I have the I have met the threshold to be in this space. I made the application, I was shortlisted, I deserve to be in this space. You may even know people that you are better off, that are there already. So you know that actually that's an indication that I should be there. But you are not, you are in that space. We are still waiting on the Lord. I don't know this evening what you're waiting on the Lord for. Maybe you're waiting on the Lord for that spouse, for that job, for that promotion, for that revelation, 
for that elevation, but you're in that space. And as you keep praying to God, as you keep coming to church, you keep asking yourself so many questions, so many questions, so many questions. And why do we need God in these waiting seasons? Why do we need God in this waiting season? The first reason why we need God in these waiting seasons is that actually, if we are not careful, waiting seasons can make us become very bitter. And it can make us become bitter with God, it can make us become bitter with self, and it can make us become bitter with others. That you've been in that space for so long, you know you are qualified, you know you shouldn't be there, but you look around you, the opposite happens to other people. So it can become, you can become bitter with God, you can become bitter with yourself, and you can become bitter with others. You feel that actually, I'm still here because of so-and-so. If so-and-so had done this or this, I shouldn't have been in this space. And that's why you need God. In those seasons of waiting, you need the Lord to be with you. Because he knows the reason why you are there. The second reason why we need God in this waiting season is that actually waiting season can make us compromise our faith. I know each and every one of us have examples of it. Even we are the examples of times where we couldn't just wait for the Lord to act. And we compromised and did some things. Maybe we used corrupt means. Maybe we sought help from other altars other than the altar of God. That you wanted to quicken that process. With that bank picture, you call that watchman, give him something to take you ahead of the line that you couldn't just wait for the process. There are also, uh, in these waiting seasons, why you also need the Lord, is that these waiting seasons, if we, the Lord is not with us, we can actually shift directions. You see, some of us were in seasons where the Lord was molding us to be something or someone better in this uh, society. But because we couldn't just wait, because we couldn't allow the waiting season to complete itself, we sought other things that it made us drift from what the Lord had intended for us. So we find ourselves so different from what God had created us to do in this land of the living. And actually there are people in the Bible, biblical examples of people that you can see and learn from who actually waited on the Lord. Even as we saw last week, Abraham and Sarah waited to have Isaac. Noah waited in two aspects. Number one, he waited for the rains to come. That you are here building this ark. It's a dry season. You don't even know when the rain will come. People are looking at you. And you are waiting for that rain to come so that you prove these people that actually you are called by God. And so the second bit, he also waited for the flood waters to subside. That you don't know what happened once you entered this uh, uh, boat. You don't know what happened on the other side. But you are here waiting on the Lord to instruct of you where to come. And that was the story of Noah. David, who patiently waited for 25 years as recorded in scripture, before ascending to the throne. That yes, he was sure that the Lord called him. Actually, he passed an interview, an interview that all his brothers failed in, and he was chosen, anointed by the man of God, and told that actually you are the one that the Lord has set apart to be the king of these people, Israel. But still waited for 25 years, even going to serve the one that is sure I'm supposed to take over from this person, waiting season. And the list goes on of people who waited on the Lord. And there are also reasons, uh, seasons in our lives where actually you see that people enjoy waiting. So waiting is not only those bad times. There are seasons that people actually enjoy waiting. For example, if you have mothers who are waiting to have a baby in the season of gestation, they're actually waiting in anticipation. And if you look at what they do during those times, you see that they make those special rooms for that baby. They start looking for a name for that baby. They start looking for those clothes and so on for that baby. So they are waiting in anticipation of what is coming ahead of them. There are even those seasons where maybe you're preparing for a family visit. There are those visitors, special visitors, 
who are coming to your house. So you are waiting with expectation. You are cleaning the house. You are changing something here and there, rearranging things because of this special visitor who is coming. And even young people know what it means to even wait for that graduation. When you go to that employment letter, waiting to report to work. When you go to that promotion, maybe waiting to assume that office. So there are those seasons where act waiting actually is enjoyable. And you're anticipating the other side. And when the Bible says that we wait upon the Lord, when scripture, when you read a scripture, and it instructs you that actually my son, my daughter, wait upon the Lord. I don't know about you, but this is not an exciting thing to read. We all want those scriptures that tell you that actually your breakthrough is here. This is what you'll do. But when you read that scripture and the Lord instructs of you, speaks to you, and tell you that wait on me. I know I speak for everyone when I say that we actually don't anticipate those seasons. And these seasons, actually as we'll be seeing, are seasons that are so important in our lives. The devil uses this season to put things in our minds, to lead us to different directions, to feed us with different information. You see, we are in the season of waiting. When we're in the season of waiting, we're in those seasons because God wants to develop us both in faith and in trust. That God puts you in that waiting room. God puts you in that waiting room because there's something he wants to develop in you. There's an attribute that actually the Lord wants to develop in you. And God wants to develop that faith and that trust in you. And like Abraham, for some of us, God is working something in us. It's taking so long because he's developing that faith and trust in him. That eventually when you have that which you've been waiting on, there's a character in you that the Lord has worked on. Again, when in those waiting season, God wants to shift our desires. That some of us, our desires are erected towards idol gods. So God puts you in a space where he wants to shift your desires. He's working on you to shift something in you so that you elevate him above every other thing. That you're in those seasons where he is working with you, walking with you, asking you to seek of him, to know him better, so that he works on the things that you elevate in your heart. So that it's only him that is elevated in your heart. And actually in this waiting season, this is a season where God is actually putting things in space. And these are the deceptions that the devil is not making us see. The devil is showing you of the other people who made it that you deserve than them. The devil is showing you of those shortcuts that you can take and reach that destination. But the Lord actually wants to develop your faith in trust. He wants to shift your desires and he wants to get everything in place for you. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, he says that he has made everything beautiful in his time. And this is the deception that the devil don't want us to understand. That actually in God's time, he has made everything beautiful. He said that he has also set eternity in human hearts, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to the end. So in these seasons where we are waiting, as you feel that you're losing hope, actually God is putting things in place. When David in those 25 years could have felt that he's losing hope, God was building his character. Because of the battles that David could have fought when, fought when he was king, actually he could not have faced them and won them had he not gone through those 25 years. So some of us in those 25 years, you feel that you can give up. But what God is preparing you ahead, you actually need those 25 years. That when you look back and see that waiting room that you are in, that when you look back and see that long queue that you are in, the moment you get what God places in your hand, you hold it and handle it with care. Because God builds a character in you. God builds something in you that can actually handle that which is now places in your hand. So some of us are rushing to get that thing in our hands. Some of us are rushing to get to that counter, rushing to get to that room. But the Lord is putting you in a season where he's working in something in you. I'd rather our prayer and hope be that we change what we pray for and ask the Lord that first ten the lessons to me. Make me understand, open my eyes that I may see what you have and want me to get in this season. 
rather than praying and looking for shortcuts to get to that which you are really looking forward to. So some of us, those seasons, the Lord has actually not put you in that season because he has forsaken you. The Lord is working something in you. The Lord is developing something in you. And the Lord is putting everything in place. The Lord is also sovereignly working on our behalf. In those seasons where you feel you are alone, you feel you are neglected, you feel I'm the only one in this place, no one understands me. Actually, the Lord is telling of you that he's actually sovereignly working on your behalf. If you read the book of Isaiah 64, 1 to 4, it says that since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you. And he finishes by saying that who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. So actually when the Lord puts you in a waiting season, he has not just left you there desperately alone. There's something he's doing. There's something he's acting at the back door. There's something he's working. There's something he's preparing for you. That when you come out of that waiting room, actually you are fit to have what he has prepared for you. So this writer says that he has never seen a God who acts on behalf of those who wait on him. So he has just put you on a space where you, you sit here and wait. But there's something that I'm acting on behalf of you. And some of these waiting seasons are, are actually a form of test to us. You see, Samuel told Saul to wait for him to come and offer that sacrifice. But the scriptures say that this king Saul could not just wait. Saul went ahead and offered that sacrifice. So Samuel delayed and Saul could not just wait. And he went and did that which was against the word of the Lord. You can see that in 1 Samuel 13. So some of us, the Lord is putting us and instructing us that actually stay in this space. There is something I'm working on. But the desires of our hearts, the voice of the enemy tells us that you can't just wait. You are the king. Come out, offer that sacrifice. You are the king. People want to go to that battle. People want to go and face that thing. You look at your life, there are so many bills ahead of you. Like Saul saw that battle ahead of him. You look at your life, age is catching with you. You look at your life, that disease is taking you down. But the instruction of the Lord is wait. Unlike Saul, you are like, no, no, no. This will consume us if I don't act. This will consume us if I don't come out and do something. And he went and offered that sacrifice. But the Lord's instruction was to wait. So he failed that test. And some of us in this season, God just wants to approve us. You see, David waited for 25 years before he became king of Israel. And by the time David was king and ruling Israel, no one remembered those seasons of waiting. Everyone referred to him as King David. Everyone referred to him as the mighty David. No one referred to those seasons of waiting. You see, some of us, the Lord wants to approve us. That he wants to give you something that no one will even look down on. Something that when you look back and see that this only is God. It is only God who has enabled me to be in this space. It is only God who has enabled me to come and be in this position. You see, at the right time, the Lord approved of David. Some of us, the Lord wants to improve different things in us. Some of us, the Lord wants to mature different things in us. Some of us, the Lord wants to teach different things to us in those waiting seasons. Are you in that waiting seasons? So what do we need to know about these seasons of waiting? What do we need to know about these seasons of waiting? Number one is that waiting is a time of preparation and growth. Waiting is a time of preparation and growth. You see, God uses this time to grow us and prepare us for the season ahead. And God wants us to be ready before we can be successful. You see, for you to be successful but not ready is a shaky foundation. But there is a readiness that if success comes and lands on it, it's a firm foundation. And the Lord wants to prepare us the season ahead. We don't know what God wants to prune in us. We don't know what God wants to build in us, but he's preparing you for what is ahead of you. Isaiah says in Isaiah 40, 31, that those who wait 
on the Lord shall actually renew their strength. So there is a renewal of strength that comes through that waiting season. There is a strength that you can't have if you rush and get it. There is a renewal of that strength. So there is a strength that you get in that space. The second thing that we need to know about the season of waiting is that actually waiting grows patience and trust. Waiting grows patience and trust. Waiting gives that opportunity for you to grow in these two things, patience and trust. You see, the only way we can walk through these seasons is to trust in the Lord. Because this season you can look at, there is nothing you can do. You can't jump that queue. You can't take yourself to that office to see that boss. You just have to wait. So you're hoping on a force higher than you to make things faster. So that season teaches you to trust in the Lord. So this is a season that makes us acknowledge that actually there is someone beyond my ability. These are seasons that teach us to only trust in the Lord. Isaiah again in chapter 55 verse 9 says that as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than you and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So waiting season is that season that you actually acknowledge that actually there is one who is in charge of everything. I surrender to him. There is one who holds my future. I surrender to him. There is one who knows why I'm here because I'm sure he called me. I'm sure he put this before me. I'm sure he's the one who put this burden in me. So there is one who is in charge. So I know that this is who is in charge is higher than me. His ways are higher than my ways, so I need to trust on him. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts, so I need to trust on him. And he goes on and says that actually you he surrender everything to this person because he's higher than him. And surrendering is just like saying that actually, Lord, here are my plans. I acknowledge that you are higher than me. Here are my plans. Come and take charge. Here is what I'm looking at. Come and take control. The waiting season. Paul writing to the Romans in chapter 8 says that if we hope, in other versions says if we wait, if we hope for what we, don't, we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So if you hope for what you know you do not have yet, you patiently wait for it. Because you know that there is someone who holds this future. There is someone who holds what is ahead of me. So you wait for it patiently. If I have money and you know it's my money, and you've come to ask me for money, you wait until I give it to you. So if we come to the understanding that in the seasons that we are in, actually there is one who holds that future. We'll have that attitude of waiting patiently. Thirdly, waiting builds that character of humility. It grows that character for what lies ahead. There is a character of being humble. There is a character of being hum uh, 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 having humility that you can only get in the season of waiting. Most of us desire and want those popcorn success. But there is a character that we miss if we do not wait and have it. And God uses these waiting seasons to build a foundation to sustain what he has ahead of you. So he builds a foundation, that is the character, that even when you will have what he has prepared ahead of you, you have what it takes to hold it. You have what it takes to hold grip to him. Because the Lord knows that for that which he has set aside for you, for that which he has called you to be, for that future that he has promised you, that word that he says that I know the plans I have for you. Plans for your prosperity, that prosperity. Plans not to harm you, that safety. Plans to give you a hopeful future, that future. He knows for you to hold it. There is a character he needs to work on you. The waiting season. And that brings us to the scripture that we read today. First Samuel chapter number one as introduces this man, Elkanah. Elkanah had two wives, one Penina and the other Hannah. Scripture says that this Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Actually, Scripture even talks of his sons and daughters. When Elkanah was issuing the things to offer as sacrifice, he gave them to uh, Penina 
and to her children, her sons and daughters. That's what scripture says. But to Hannah, scripture only says that Elkanah only gave her. Though he gave her double portion, so saying that actually she didn't have children. And it goes on and says that actually she was barren and it is the Lord who had closed her womb. And in verse 11 shows how this woman, Hannah, cried to the Lord. He cried to the Lord and he said in verse 11, that and she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you'll only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servants, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used in his head. So this is a woman who had been in a season of waiting. That she has waited for so long that she even cried to God like some of us. That you've been in that season waiting and hoping on the Lord. As she was waiting, she's just seeing her co-wife Penina getting children after children. And if you read scripture, when scripture introduces them in verse number two, he said that he had two wives, one called Hannah and the other called Penina. So by Hannah being mentioned first, it insinuates that actually she may be the first wife. So you are there as the first wife, the second wife coming. And if you see the words of Elkanah way down there, she's telling Hannah, am I more to you than ten children? Maybe it's insinuated that maybe her co-wife had ten children. So seeing child after child being born, and she knows I am the first wife. She knows this man loves me more. She knows he takes care of me more, gives me a double portion every time we go and pray. She trusts in the Lord because she calls herself a servant of the Lord in verse 11. But season after season, going to Shiloh season after season without a child, waiting on the Lord. I don't know if this is someone's story tonight. That is something you've been so waiting on the Lord for. But the people around you are just having abundance in this that you are waiting on the Lord for. You see, there's a day I was watching news and hearing someone talking about a rich person having millions. Being equated to worth of millions of shillings. And you're in a space where you're just asking God for one million. It's like you're in that season, you're looking, there's someone who has abundance of what you really hope for. There's someone who has abundance of what you've been praying for. Hannah had children. Penina had children. Hannah needed just one. When she cries to God in verse 11, she just pray for her son. And the co-wife has sons and daughters. The waiting season. That she's looking around her. It brought bitterness to her. Scripture says that she cried bitterly to God. Scripture says that her co-wife ridiculed her. Maybe calling her names. She was in that season. So I don't know what you're facing in your waiting season. That sometimes you even fear coming out. You fear going to, go, going to those get-togethers. You fear going to those spaces. Because if you look at your co-wives, quote-unquote, they are doing much better than you. But the Lord is telling you, my son and my daughter, you are just in a waiting season. There is something I'm working on you, that if I finish working on you, people won't imagine who you are. You only need to trust me. There is a space I've put you. There is a character I'm building in you. Because what you are praying for, you need this character to hold it. There is something I'm placing in you. You see, for Hannah, the child that she bore, she needed that grace to let go, to have that child do what she could do. I'm not sure if Penina was asked to give one of her children to go to the temple and serve the Lord, if she could have agreed. But Hannah had to be taken through this season. Where you are broken, where you are built in character, where you grow in knowing God, that actually you partner with God in this ministry. That you know that this that you are building in me, in line with what you will place in my hand, actually is to glorify your holy name. So that, that day when you place me on that seat, that day when you place me on that table, I shall be to glorify you. That, name when I, when, that day when I'm on that table, when I look back, when people ask me, it is you that I'll glorify 
Nikiwambia ni God, I mean it from my heart. Because I knew that no power of me made me come to this space. That's the beauty of that waiting season. And from this story, we learn how to wait from this wonderful woman, Hannah. How to wait. And number one, we are being taught to wait from a position. Wait from a position. Wait from a position. So you're not just waiting like anyone else. You're waiting from a position. You see, for those who have children, if you go home and your son or your daughter asks you for something, you don't look at him or her like, who are you? Why are you asking me this? If you don't have the money, you'll promise. If I get the money, I'll do this. If you have it, you'll say, I'll come with it. If you have it with you, you'll give you it. Because this person is asking from a point of right. So, in these waiting seasons that we are in, we need to wait from a position. What is your position in God? John 15:15, 15, 15, as Christ talks to his disciples, he tells them that I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what his master's business is. So these people had walked with Christ for now three years because this was towards the end of Christ's career here on earth. They had walked with him for three years. That he say that I now no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. He said that instead I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. So you see, these people walked with God to earn a position. That you are now no longer a servant, you are now a friend. And even as we possess that scripture, that if we are in Christ, you are now no longer servants, but we are friends. And he goes on and says that now everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. So there is a knowledge that you can only have if you are in a certain position. You see, there are meetings that not anyone can just walk in. They are classified. This is for this class. This is for this level of people. So you need to fit in that level for you to attend that meeting. So there is a revelation that you only need to have by walking with God. That you've walked with God, that you've understood him. That you've stood with him and walked with him and obeyed his commands. That actually he looks at you and says that actually you've earned this space, Buona Sifiwe. Praise the Lord. There is a revelation, as I've said, that you can only have if you are in the right position. And there are demands that you can only make if you have the right to make that demand. Verse 11, Hannah said that if you, only you could look at your servant's misery. This was so provoking. If only you could look at your servant's misery. That she puts herself that under the misery that she was in. She's reminding God that I'm your servant. Under the weeping bitterly that she was going through, she's reminding God that actually I am your servant. Under the ridicule that she was going through from her co-wife, she's reminding God that actually the person praying to you is your servant. And you see the first position that we have in God is accepting Christ as Lord and Savior in our lives. Then walking by God on a day-to-day -day basis and learning and growing in knowing him. Sarah had earned that position year after year, going to Shiloh, offering that double portion. Year after year, going to Shiloh, trusting on the Lord. Year after year, growing in faith, even having the courage to ask the Lord for a son, not even a child. Grow in knowing God and earning that position. Scripture says that she even gave uh, the, the boy that was yet to be born, she even gave that child a position before God. Scripture says that I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. So she understood having what it means having a position in the Lord. That yes, her position was a servant, but prophetically she's even declaring that even this that you'll give me, even this that I'm asking of you will belong to you. What is your position? That which you are hoping for, that which you are trusting the Lord for. What is that position of that thing in the service of God? What is that thing, what does that thing have a position in, in the ministry of the Lord? For Hannah, she placed that child in the service of the Lord. 
So I don't know if I'm talking to someone not yet plugged into the Lord. The Lord is asking of you that in those waiting seasons, you need to have a position in me. The second thing that we learn about waiting from this story of Hannah is that we need to wait expectantly. Wait expectantly. You see, Hannah knew the Lord personally. And she knew God by his character. If you read the prayers in chapter 1 of First Samuel verse 11, she actually says that she calls him Lord. She calls him God Almighty and she calls him like the giver of all gifts. She acknowledges that this is actually the giver of all gifts. Because she comes to him. She doesn't go and beg the husband. She doesn't go and complain to the penina to even uh, give her one child. She goes to God acknowledging that actually you are the giver of gifts. Bless me with a son. So she had walked with God to actually understand that this is who God is. Scripture says that she worships him knowing that actually she was in the presence of he who could change her life. David says in Psalm 37, 25 that actually I was young and now I'm old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or the children begging bread. So this is a man who had walked with God for so long to understand that actually this God that I know does not forsake the righteous. This God that I know doesn't have the children of the righteous begging bread. So the question is, as you are walking expectantly, you only expect from what you know. So what do you know of the Lord? See, some of us are asking great things, but we serve a God that you don't know even holds those things. Some of us are walking in different paths that we don't know that we serve a God who can actually provide those things. What do you know about God? Because that is what will make you expect of him. So you only expect out of what you can give. If you know someone personally and you're in a problem, if you scroll your phone book, you choose the person that you can call based on the expectation of what you know they can offer to you. There are some that you skip because you don't expect anything from them. Because you've walked and known them for quite some time that you know this one if I call at an pair excuse. So how long or how have you walked with God for you to know so that you expect of him in those waiting seasons? For Hannah, her prayer is even elevated above her present situations. She prays for a son and not a child. And actually in verse 18, after, uh, after talking to Eli, after Eli talking to her, she says that, may my servant, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. That after talking to Eli, after coming to Shiloh, after praying, she left that space that day and went home, and scripture record that her face was no longer downcast. Because there is something deep in her. There is a knowledge that she had that raised her expectation. That she left that altar knowing that today, based on what I know about this God, today he has moved. Based on what I know, what I've heard, what I've seen this God do, I'm leaving this Shiloh, I'm leaving this altar, knowing that he has answered my prayer. Some of us come here on Wednesday, based on how you know God, there is a season you can enter a prayer room and present a prayer to God. And you leave that prayer based on how you know the Lord. You live there telling people, expect my testimony. Because you've walked with this God so long for you to know. So how much do you know of the Lord? How long have you walked with him? How deep are you in intimacy with him? Because that is what will guide your expectation. You see, for Hannah, her prayer was elevated because of based on what she knew. And actually, James describes this in James 5, 7. He says that, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. So James is bringing this to context and says that there is a level, and he quotes this level to a farmer, that you plant expecting harvest. Hannah left that space expecting a solution. 
She waited expectantly. See, patience coming is coming with the idea that I'm actually expecting a result in this thing. You see, this is how some of us don't view waiting. That you are waiting just in that space. We don't understand that actually in this space, I need to understand, know the design, know the ways of the one that I'm waiting to bring these things out of me. James says that there will be those times when we simply have to wait. You see, when you've planted, you have to wait till the harvest time. But as a farmer, you wait knowing that if I've planted this, this is what I'll harvest. If I've planted in this piece of land, this is the number of bugs I expect. If I've planted this crop, this is what I expect to happen. And we need to, uh, to wait with such expectation because the farmer is waiting and hoping that when the time comes, I actually shall harvest. Also the story in John 5 of that invalid man who had been invalid for 38 years waiting at that pool for someone to just come and push him to the pool. When Jesus asked him, he said that I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. So this man was waiting and expecting someone will actually come. I don't know when we are praying to God as we are waiting in the season. Are we waiting the expectation? This man was there for 38 years, year after year, day after day, just expecting that someone will come. When the water is stirred, someone will come and help me in that pool. Thirdly and finally, what we learn from this story about waiting is that we wait firmly or courageously. We need to wait firmly or courageously. You see, the waiting season really needs courage. The waiting season needs us to be firm. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 42. In verse 3, he says that my tears have been my food day and night. A season of waiting. My tears have been my food day and night. So the psalmist had been crying day and night. He goes on and says that while people say to me all day long, where is your God? So he needed courage to face these people. That day and night, he trusts in the Lord. Day and night, you come to church. Day and night, you pray for this and that. Day and night, you are convicted that actually the Lord has set me apart for something. And people are looking at you and asking you, where is your God? In verse 10, since still of Psalm 42, he says that my bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? You see, in waiting seasons will come those uh, times. Like Hannah, Penina, tormenting her. Where is your God? You're the one who goes to Shiloh with the double portion. Where is your God? You're the one whom our husband Elkanah loves more. Where is your God? Why doesn't your God give you that child? Even you, you in your office, people know you are the one who reads scripture. People know you are the one who trusts in God. But when promotion comes, where is your God? When that elevation comes, where is your God? You need courage. You need to be firm. Waiting courageously is facing that is ahead of you and trusting that actually there is a force above me, which is the Lord, that will see me through it. You see, people like Daniel, they chose to have gratitude for God over fear for people. He chose to put God above the people. And scripture says that he never stopped praying to God even when people instructed him to do so. Where is your God? You need that courage. Like Daniel, he had that courage to face those people. That I'm praying to this God, no matter what you tell me. Esther motivated by believing that actually God had a plan to save people through her. She had courage to go before the king. She had courage to go and stand in the gap for her people. Where is your God? In these seasons, you need that courage. David believed that actually God will protect him like the many other times when he put himself forward to face the giant. You see, even in these waiting seasons, there are those giants, those mockers that we need to face, that we need to have and gather that courage to face them. So that when the question asks, where is our God, we have the courage to face it. 
The psalmist says in Psalm 30 verse 5 as I conclude part B. He says that weeping may stay for a night. But joy comes in the morning. How long the night will be, we don't know. How long your night will be, we don't know. But what we know is that joy will come in the morning. There's a joy that will come in the morning that will make you even not remember how weeping was. You see, for Hannah to hold that baby, she even forgot what it felt not to have him. For Hannah to hold that baby, she forgot those days that she was weeping and crying. What will now Penina mock her about now that she has that baby? That is the joy that comes in the morning. The joy of the Lord is that space of sustenance that actually it overpowers those days of sorrow. Scripture says that after Hannah had this child and presented to the Lord as promised, she had other children. You see, that is the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord comes when you wait in that season, when you have that promotion and look back and say that actually I did not bribe anyone. Actually, this is what I trusted the Lord for. Actually, I walked with the Lord in this and actually he has made it happen. That is the joy that comes in the morning. Joy that comes in the morning in that space that you are living in what the Lord has given you. You are living in the fruits that the Lord has given you without regret. That you look back and say that actually I do not regret doing anything. Because I was faithful in the season of waiting. I was faithful in the seasons of waiting. I don't know what you're waiting on the Lord for. Wait on the Lord. This is waiting with the assurance that actually I'm in this space. But I serve a God who will renew my strength. Scripture says that actually he'll renew our strength. He'll mount up with wings like eagles. We shall run and not be weary. We shall walk and not faint. That is the joy that comes in the morning. My brothers and sisters, I don't know what season of waiting you are in. But this is what the Lord is telling of us. This is what the Lord is telling of us. That there is a joy at the end of that tunnel that we do not even know of. Shall we stand up and pray as we conclude? And as this word was coming to us, as we wait on the Lord, we need to remember to dwell on the salvation that he has given unto us through Christ. That's the first point. It's accept accepting him as Lord and Savior. We need to remember that because actually the same grace that saved you from sin is the same grace that will sustain you in those different seasons. And I pray that that grace will just fall on us this evening. There are lots that we go through that the voice of the enemy is so loud to us, whispering those options, as scripture says, knocking on the door, waiting for you to answer so that he may devour you, giving you those options. Tonight I just want us as we go before the Lord, just tell the Lord that I want that grace in this waiting season. May I not be devoured by the enemy. The Lord, just give me grace in this season. Just declare those words over your life that God, I want grace in this waiting season. That the Lord, I want you to create in me that heart that will actually accept what you're building in me, that character that you're forming in me. Now Just whisper before the Lord and tell the Lord this, that God, may I not bow to the deception of the enemy. May I not bow to the deception of the enemy. May I know you, no matter how long I go, keep going to share. No matter how long I keep offering to you. My Father, Lord, no matter how long my enemies ridicule me, Kuliko ali 
wango javyo masu nafsi yangu bwana nafsi yangu yakungoja bwana kuliko ali wangu sue wangu javyo masu assured us that what we ask of him he shall be faithful to do it to us ask the Lord to just remember you in this waiting season, ask the Lord to remember you Father Lord we thank you and we just give you glory Jehovah oh, Father Lord your word says that there is time and seasons for everything Jehovah my Father Lord there are those times that we go through different seasons Jehovah Lord and this evening as you spoken to us some of us go through those seasons or are even in those seasons of waiting, Jehovah. My Father, Lord, we pray, Jehovah, Lord, that you may just build that character in us, Jehovah. May not fall to the deception and voices of the enemy in this season, Jehovah. May you raise us up, King of Kings, to be that which you created us to be, Jehovah. Father, Lord, we even ask for forgiveness for those times that we've fallen short of you and sought, Father, Lord, for different means because we thought that you are too late. We thought, Jehovah, Lord, that your ways are too slow. May you forgive of us, Jehovah. And as we keep waiting, Jehovah, Lord, may we just have that courage to do so. Link us with the right people in these seasons. Link us, Father, Lord, with the right connections, Jehovah, Lord. That at the end, Jehovah, Lord, like Hannah, we shall look at what you've given unto us and offer it back to you and say that it shall be yours forever because indeed it was your own doing. We pray this trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen.